Welcome and thank you for joining us for this very important conversation that we hope creates understanding and awareness of the racial inequality within the beauty industry and really share some ideas on how we can unite together to create lasting change that makes a difference for future generations. I am Leslie Perry here behind the scenes from the Professional Beauty Association. I'm also joined by my colleague Paige Peterson, who will be helping me moderate the Q&A. If you have questions, please, please, please use the Q&A box to send them in and we will address as many as we have time for today. Many thanks to our four panelists for making the time to be a part of this event. Jalia, Marquetta, Kia, Roderick, we are so grateful to you for your candor and your leadership in the industry. And thank you to the moderators, Stephen and Carrie. And with that, I turn things over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Leslie. And um, on behalf of all of us that are on the screen right here, we just wanna say thank you. And for everybody listening, we all appreciate the Professional Beauty Association. We appreciate your advocacy on so many different fronts in this industry to support our industry to be stronger than ever before, uh, whether it's tax relief reform, whether it's licensing, uh, whether it's supporting uh, schools to be uh, more well run, whether it's supporting what's happening on the manufacturer, the distributor and at the salon level, you guys do so much to help us. So thank you so much. And uh, for being committed to have an important conversation, which we're gonna have today, first of many. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm a business coach and trainer in our industry. I've been doing it for 26 years. Uh, I am passionately committed to serving our industry in many different ways. Um, and I'm honored that the PBA has asked uh, me uh, to be a moderator here. Uh, myself and Carrie were both very humbled uh, to be chosen uh, and we're excited to be here. That's all I'm gonna say about me because we don't have a lot of time and we have important stuff to get into. Um, when you think about quality in an industry, uh, there's so many different ways that it can be attacked, whether it's at the school level, whether it's in the salon, whether it's what the salon is putting out in their community, to support communities at the community level, also at the manufacturer and the distributor level and as educators as well. So I think um, our panel represents a, a um, really a cross pollination of, of all of those different avenues within our industry and each of them have um, powerful stories, uh, lots of success, lots of challenges that they've had to go through, lots of additional challenges that they've had to go to just by the mere fact that their color of their skin created more of a challenging uh, pathway for them in certain instances. So I think we're all going to be humbled and appreciative to hear their story. Um, I'm going to spend some time um, doing some Q&A myself with Aliyah and with and with Roderick. And Roderick, you and I go back years as 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 great of friends as we are. Ladies first, etiquette always reigns in oh, our 100%, world. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Absolutely. I would have it. Listen, I would have it no other way. My mama would come from heaven and slap fire out me. So yes, ladies <laughs> always. I love it. I love it. So, Leah, why don't you take a um, quick moment for those that don't know you? You, you and I go back a few years back to Beacon when you were a student there. Um, and I've always had a soft spot for your career and been committed to your success. And you know, you've had a a, a really powerful um, in a short period of time. It takes people years to break in to be an educator and to break in to do session work. And uh, you know, by that uh, standard, you've you've done very very well for yourself. But if you can share a little bit about your background and what you do, uh, and then we'll get into some questions about how your journeys led you here and what are some solutions that you've thought of that. Uh, we can bring to our industry so all of us, no matter what avenue we are in, in this industry can get better at who we are and what we do. Okay, so my name is Julia Pettis. I am based in Phoenix, Arizona. I am a licensed esthetician and professional makeup artist. Um, I've been based in Arizona for about eight years now. I was in South Carolina previously. I'm originally from Michigan, but I spent many years in South Carolina. And um, my background actually started on the business side of things. I was in corporate human resources management 
And I did that, I have that background for probably as long as everybody here has been in the beauty industry, I've been in the business side of things, so over 20 years. So for me, I'm probably the rookie of, out of everyone here um, with a little over 10 years in the beauty game. So um, it's been a huge transition for me, um, but it's been a blessing all at the same time because me having that business background, it helped make me and shake me in so many different facets so that once I did obtain my license, I was able to hit the ground running. And uh, thankfully, that's what I've been blessed to do. Love that. And when you think about your your career, you, you do many different things. If you can describe some of the avenues that you operate in right now. Okay, so my main business is 3J Productions and it is an umbrella company. So everything from the glam side to, you know, hair, makeup, wardrobe to the business side as far as putting together business plans, marketing strategies, um, lookbooks, whatever that might look like for the individuals that are in the beauty, fashion, and entertainment spaces. And then I also help with the event coordination and the creative and artistic direction. So when you think of, oh my gosh, I want to build a brand. I don't know where to start. I want to put all of these different things together. What can I do? I can guide the individual from A through Z. Uh, to help them start where they need to be within their business. So I know a lot of times when people think of me, they only think of the makeup artist side of me, um, yeah. but I am a multi-talented individual and I know people don't like to you know, say that and they say, you know, you can only be great at one thing. That's not true. I'm great at many things and I'm very thankful to be great at many things because each one of those things I have taken the time to build my skill set, build my education and people need to understand that when you're skilled at many things, um, you're going to have some ridicule and then of course at the same time, you're going to have those individuals that are going to cheer you on and have your back. So for me, it's, you know, it's interesting because I know when I relocated from South Carolina to Arizona, it was like I had to rebrand and reintroduce myself all over again. Um, but being a part of the Professional Beauty Association, being a Beacon student, being a Naha finalist, all of those things just help further solidify me. And education was just an easy niche to fall into since I already had that training background being a part of human resources. And now the reason why I wanted you to share all these different um, hats that you wear uh, and all your different passions is it, it has you um, uh, engage so many different arenas within the industry. Uh, from that perspective, um, where can we improve in uh, creating equality and having more consciousness, consciousness, excuse me, in this conversation how can the path to success uh be more easeful and equal and meritorious from your point of view from my point of view it's difficult because i know i've seen a lot of the things that have been coming across social media and it's been very inclusive of hair but we forget about the barbers we forget about the skincare therapists and the makeup artists and the nail techs all of us are feeling it in every facet of the beauty industry and i'm totally not excluded from that i've been in scenarios and situations where i was hired because they couldn't um, find anybody to do african-american skin and then i've also been in situations where i was hired because they looked at me with first glance and didn't assume that i was african-american they felt that i was mixed race so they didn't know what my race was and they thought that they could get away with a few things being said on set and i had to quickly nip that in the bud so there's so much work that needs to be done um I know when I relocated out here, that was one of the first things that I got was another makeup artist that reached out to me and stated that they had a client that was black and they didn't feel comfortable doing it. They had never done African-American skin and could I take the client? And I was like, why don't you know how to do African-American skin? As an African-American, I have to learn how to do makeup on everybody. 
I don't say because you're ivory, you can't sit in my chair. Because you're ebony, you can't sit in my chair. I learned on every skin tone and every skin texture. And I had to do that. So why is it okay that I have to do that? But there are other individuals that can get by with, oh, it's okay. I'll just wait for somebody that is of that ethnic background to do that individual's makeup and then feel comfortable. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. A lot, a lot, a lot of work. So what I'm hearing you say, Julia, is really powerful. And if I can add an idea to anybody listening, if you are a salon or spa or barbershop owner out there, um, if you are, if you run and operate a school, um, equality in education is mission critical. Everybody needs to learn everything. If you own a salon, uh, how about part of your interviewing process is to ensure that people that you hire are multi-talented and every type of, of, of hair texture, uh, in every type of skin and skin tone, uh, making that a requirement. How about having your team go through education now if they're not? Uh, that seems to be something uh, that would be sensible that anybody can do now that can move the dial. What do you think about that, Julia? Absolutely. Um, I think that it's important that each of us, no matter what our specific niche is, we don't get to a point where we stop learning. Um, you have to continually learn new skills so that you can stay relevant. I mean, we're in an industry that's ever changing and not really necessarily ever changing, but it's constantly repeating itself. So you need to understand period hair. Um, and it's not just because you are, you have the idea that you want to work on um, sets or commercials or film or television. It's because those things need to be in your pack, back pocket. Yes, I love clean beauty. I, I am all about it. But that doesn't mean if somebody comes to me on a set and says, can you do a black eye? I'm going to be like, no. I, I have to know how to do that in order to be marketable in many different um, facets of the industry. So it's important that, yes, if you're in a school and you don't feel like you're getting the education that you need, as it relates to different textures, different tones, then you do need to speak up and say something. And you can't be afraid to do that. We're in a time now where you can no longer be afraid to keep your mouth closed. Love that. Love that. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, we all have a unique opportunity. I think, you know, Carrie and I were talking earlier today and, and you know, a context that we were both vibing on is that um, we're all leaders in this industry. Um, on should be the day, oh, I'm just a hairdresser, I'm just an esthetician, like that just word before it. We must stand up and be proud of who we are and what we do. Uh, and as it relates to this conversation, we must remember that we are leaders uh, so that in our communities, we have a voice. Even if you don't own the salon, if you see 20 guests a week, those 20 people trust you to guide them. They trust you uh, to lay your hands on them and to heal them and to make them look and feel great. You have a voice, you have a platform. 20 people a week is 80 people a month. And if your guest cycle is six to eight weeks, you're seeing over close to 200 people in your community that trust you. What do you wanna say about this conversation? Cause they're walking into your business and they own businesses and they work in workplaces. How can your dialogue be meaningful enough to create transformation in your community? If you have 500 to a thousand people that see you and that come into your business, those are 500 to a thousand people a month that can go out into the greater community and bring these messages. And because we have such a high level of trust, people trust us so much that there's going to be an inherent higher degree of respect for what we have to say because there's a higher level of safety and i and i, I really think we must all use our voice in that way um you know uh absolutely you know you you julia are are in a lot of different avenues in the session world that you're in um what needs to be done differently how can we get better from uh kicking the doors down so that there's uh, not that pigeonholing that you said you've experienced. Oh, I'm hired because I'm the black person. How do we change what's going on in that world? What are your thoughts there? Um, my thought would be to one, diversify your portfolio. Make sure that your portfolio resembles many different types of people. That way, when people come to you and say, can you do this? All you have to do is send them to your website, not your social media page, to your website. 
um, because there is totally a difference. So you want to make sure that you're presenting something that's professional, that you are 100, you like, literally, I have things in my Dropbox on my phone, somebody asked me for it, all I have to do is press one button and it's sent to them. You know, you have to be ready and prepared at all times. Um, so you want to have that diversity in your portfolio. On the flip side, um, we need to encourage individuals in the session world, in the film and television spaces, that they need to be open to hiring um, individuals that are Black, that are Asian, that are Hispanic. They need to be willing to hire all of these people because it doesn't make, it, it, there's nothing worse than hiring somebody just because of what their ethnic background is. Like, you have no idea how that feels to an individual that has to go on set and has to smile and grin in everybody's face and be everybody's favorite person. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, know that people are whispering or you're wondering what they're saying about you, waiting to see what your review is going to be. That puts you in a very stressful space. And as professionals, we want to go to work and have a good time. You know, we shouldn't have to be worried about what this one or that one is saying about our work. So um, I think it's very important that the individuals that are making the decisions um, they they make the decision on looking at a, a bigger talent pool. Um, I know people just go straight to those individuals that are considered influencers or have a huge following, but there's so many individuals out here that are super talented that people haven't even had the time to recognize or don't want to recognize because of their following. You know, so I think people need to be a little bit more open um, and that will be helpful. So it's two sides of the coin. For us, we have to do the work with making sure that our portfolio is diverse. And then on the flip side, that whoever is making the hiring decisions needs to go into it saying, you know what, this is the criteria that I'm looking for. And it not being based on the individual skin color, but based on their skill set. Based on the merit. That is so beautiful and so well said. Um, Roderick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you in now. Um, and you know, let you know, you and I go back many a years. Um, we're really great friends. Honored by hey, that. Stephen. Yeah. Sorry, it's not. I'm so sorry to interrupt. We've been having questions, and I think I jumped right in before we got a chance to introduce everybody, and we just like jumped right in. So if you wouldn't mind, if you could introduce the rest of the panel, we got ahead of ourselves. Yeah, and then sure. we could sorry. Follow up with Roderick. <laughs> sorry, guys. We just like jumped right in. So let's. let's <laughs> Thank you. <so> much. <laughs> Yeah, my bad, everybody. So, you know, why don't we, um, uh, we'll, we'll just keep the ladies going, you know, you guys before us. Um, I will start with my fellow moderator, Carrie. Hi, everybody. I am Carrie Davis Duffy. I'm so honored to be here. So thank you guys so much for um, allowing me to participate in this really powerful conversation. Um, I am born and raised in San Diego, California, and I have um, uh, three salons here in San Diego. We have about 90 staff uh, company-wide, and I also have a company called Beauty Backbone, where uh, I help salon owners to create success, sustainability systems, and we have education programs, and so I like to play in all different playgrounds uh, of this industry. So um, I am just absolutely thrilled to be with amongst friends um, and new friends. So you guys are, this is like, this is powerhouse right here. So I feel mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah, how about you? Yeah, if you want to oh, introduce yourself, yeah. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kia Artistically Neil. I am originally from South Carolina. Ooh, ooh, Y'all got for the hard way. Everybody. <laughs> Y'all know that. And, but I live in Maryland now in the DMV. I'm a stylist for 26 years. I uh, founded the Color Culture, the uh, Color Education, the Hub of Education for Color Focus, but I also developed the Texture Versus Race Movement, which is super impactful, especially during this time. So I'm super excited to lean into this conversation with you guys and with you industry greats and just really bang it out and break down the beauty industry and the times that we're in and see how we're gonna move forward and, and present ourselves on the other side of this. Love that. Thank you. Marquetta, how about you? Hi, everyone. I am Marquetta Breslin, and I'm so happy and thankful and honored to be here amongst 
some incredibly talented, amazing artists in the beauty industry. Um, I started in the industry around 2003 with a website called braidsbybreslin.com. So I started as a braider many, many years ago. I sold DVDs for years to teach how to do different braiding techniques. Um, after my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, I started teaching people how to make wigs, lace wigs for cancer patients. I developed my own technique couldn't find any information anywhere to do that. So I created my own, I developed my lace week training system. Um, and in the middle of doing all of that, I authored three books. I'm working on my fourth book right now. And we've sold our products and training systems to over 70 countries all over the world, thousands of customers. I work in mm -hmm. with salon owners, beauty professionals on the business side as well because unfortunately we don't learn enough of that when we go to cosmetology school. So I'm there to help them fill that gap and understand how to truly, truly uh, be in this industry and not have to break your back doing behind the chair work all the time. Awesome. Mr. Roderick Samuels. <laughs> I'm just, um, my name is happy to be here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, in, I'm in such good company, like, uh, all of these young ladies, you know, Steve, you, you and I have been friends for a long time, Carrie, this is our first time kind of kicking it, but Marquetta and Jalea and Kia, we're all transplants of South Carolina, um, which I think is a great segue into the conversation as well. Um, you know, sometimes you have to plant your seeds in grounds that haven't been cultivated all the way, um, and I know that some Sometimes, um, based on your marketplace and where you grew up and where, where you at, um, your dream and your vision is bigger than the area, um, which I could probably say for these three lovely young ladies who not only do I call my friends, but also my sisters. Um, in some way, shape, or form, over the, the years, we've had conversations, emails, and sharing information. And I think, that, um, I think that I could speak for all of us when I say this, is that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change. You know, we had to stop looking at the industry uh, years and years ago when we wanted to be a little bit more progressive about black and white. It was about, it wasn't about black and white. It was about what's right and not who's right. So we we made an effort to do what was right. And that was to the, to bridge gaps in our communities, to, to, to move forward to other areas and continue to spread that knowledge that, that we got from, from, from our ancestors and our forefathers back down in the South. And, um, you know, and, and, and again, I, and I know that um, for me, um, my grandparents, my mom, everybody was about go to school, get your education. And once you do that, you can't be stopped. And unfortunately, um, for a lot of people, they don't understand that knowledge destroys fear. I think that the lack of knowledge as far as it pertains to African-Americans in the beauty industry, um, a lot of companies don't know that. So it makes them fear us. It makes them fear you know, what our capabilities really, really are. So instead of giving us those opportunities, they'd much rather hold us back, give us a couple dollars here and here and there just to shut us up. But now it's to a point where, you know, if you don't stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And we're standing, mm -hmm. we're standing tall. And, um, you know, uh, Steve, I know you got questions, but, uh, you know, um, I, wanted, I wanted to let these three beautiful black ladies know that um, number one, I appreciate you guys so much. Um, you know, a lot of times as black women, you know, people don't know the type of sacrifices that you have to make for your family, the, ha the type of sacrifices and nurturing that you have to do not only for your own family, but for other people's family. You know, the black woman has been the backbone of many families for, for many centuries. And, um, you know, not to get too deep, but that all came from slavery too. You know, when, you know, back in the days, you know, to break the black man down, they would beat the black man in the field by himself so that he wouldn't, he would be underpowered. And that made the woman the head of the household, especially in the black community. So I applaud you guys and I, and I love you guys so much, not only because y'all are my friends, but y'all are my sisters. And I've watched each and every one of you grow and cycle and continue to be prosperous. And I can't be any prouder of 
these three women that I'm sitting on the panel for. Number one, we're standing up for South Carolina, but also we're, ki we're killing it right now. Never with a handout, starting our own businesses, being entrepreneurs, and really, really pushing, pushing the envelope forward when it comes to education, innovation, and lastly, just overall empathy for those of for those people who don't understand or know what we go through on a daily basis. That's beautiful, Roderick. Really, yes. really, really Thank well you. said. And you know, um, uh, and if people don't know you, you uh, own the Hair Lab Detroit uh, School. So you're a school owner. Uh, you've you've been a successful salon owner. Uh, you're an award-winning barber and men's hair cutter. You've won the, the the International Hairdressing Award. You're a Naha finalist. Uh, you know, so you you uh, uh, are a curriculum writer. Uh, you know, you've had your hands and heart in many a thing, um, uh, which has always been inspiring for me to play small parts in along the way. Um, uh, so those of you that don't know any more about me, I introduced myself really briefly saying I've coached for 26 years. I've had the honor of traveling all over this world as a business coach and trainer. I've written a couple of books. I'm working on a third myself. Um, I work in a lot of different avenues. My heart and my soul are committed to all of us running solvent, uh, well-run, well-organized, financially prosperous salons, spas, and barbershops, uh, where we all are proud of who we are, own, own our power in who we are, and what we do in our communities um, in whatever way, shape, or form. Learning how to run your business and is, is just as creative as the application of that cut or that color. And if we relate to it that way, we can cause a breakthrough in our context and be empowered to go on the journeys and face those fears of what we don't know enough of. Um, with that being said, Roderick, uh, let me just check in with Leslie. I want to make sure I didn't forget anything else. <laughs> Sorry. No. You good, man. Listen, you, you already got, you got, you got your first pass, okay? Let, let, yeah. Let's be clear. You got your first pass. Again, man. I'm just no, I don't, you don't want, you don't want this to circle back again, Steve, okay? You don't want this to circle back again. We're all good. No, thank you. I, no, we're all good. And if, if anything comes please, up, I'll just I'll just jump in again, but appreciate please, you all. Please save us. Please save us. <laughs> awesome. So, um, you know, Roderick, in, in your background, you know, um, we've had an interview uh, where we went on and kicked it live and had this conversation already. And, 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 um, there is uh, there is so many different ways to attack what's going on um, within our industry and within our world. Um, in in your experience, uh, what were some of the issues that you've had to face that you learned lessons from uh, that all of us here listening can learn from as it relates to racial equality? Well, I think the biggest thing is, and I, and I'm I'm glad that you said that. Um, I think the biggest thing is being a man of our word, and I'm and I am going to be a man of my word. Um, I'm supposed to be teaching right now, but I, I, I asked the young lady, uh, I wanna give a big shout out to Devette Green at Augusta Technical College. Um, I'm supposed to be teaching her students tonight. So I wanted to give them a, a, a special shout out because I'm always a forever teacher. So Abigail, Akia, uh, Elizabeth and Aaron and Hope and Jessica, um, uh, Cabria and Kashela and LaDonna and Lisa and Morgan and Nakela and uh, Chanel, Skyler, and Victoria. I apologize, but I think that you guys will get a lot more out of this presentation than I could ever bring to the table. Um, so that's my first my first thing is being a man of your word and, and having a little bit of integrity um, when it comes to down to what you're doing. Um, you guys have heard me say this before and I'll say it again and I'll forever say this, is that education in our industry is not an option, it is a must. And where I see one of the biggest problems, it starts in the schools. Um, you know, for all of us that are out there that have gone to barber school or cosmetology school when the educators feel a little inferior they like to stick the black clients with the black students and the white clients with the white students which further separates us not only as people but as an industry so you have you have black kids that come out of school that don't know anything about straight hair you got white kids that come out of school that know nothing about texture and again if we're talking about foundationally that continues to break down our industry altogether um, you know, um, I, I'm a firm believer also that, um, you know, 
we're fighting for education reform in the United States of America with the Department of Education. I also think that there's a certain level of education reform we need for our industry, for our students, for the people that are going to continue to push the envelope and be relevant um, for the, you know, the next generation. Um, our job as leaders are cre to create more leaders. But much like Jalea said, how can you create more leaders when you're only teaching them to be, be one dimensional? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, as a black barber, um, I've had to learn how to cut several textures of hair because mm -hmm. that's what I knew that I had to do in order for that acceptance. See, a, the, a lot of times as black people, we have to do and jump through hoops to get into the room, to put our foot in the door, to get that level of acceptance. And that doesn't come with being one dimensional. Um, um, my dad used to always say that when you when you stay ready, you don't have to be ready. So for me, it's nothing for me to jump on stage and cut straight hair or Afro textured hair, nothing. But if you look at some of the white artists out there, they have to be with a white, white person. They have to have a white model and the model has to have perfect hair. They have to prep before the show or whatever the case may be. And here's the thing, you can give any head of hair to any of these three young ladies plus myself on any given Sunday and we're gonna rock it out. We're gonna cut it, we're gonna style it. And we're gonna make sure that we educate our, our people that's in front of us on every Every texture, not just the texture we're working on, because again, being an African American artist, it's not about the cut, it's about the culture. And if people really dig down and start to learn a little bit about a little bit more about our culture, that will help them destroy the fear. Fear destroys, I'm sorry, knowledge destroys fear. So when you know better, you do better. And when you I mean, at the end of the day, I really just think that. You know, from a school level, we got to do better. We got to hire people that are more than capable. We need people that just aren't going to be ordinary. We need people that are going to be extraordinary and make sure that our students get everything that they need to be successful, regardless of who walks in the door. Do you think, Roderick, at the salon level, um, that there's an opportunity for our industry to educate our communities out there, people coming in to get their services, uh, to accept if the salon, if everybody in the salon can do any type of hair, uh, that there needs to be more work at the salon level to educate clients coming in uh, as to how versatile we all are. 100%. You know, I think that's one of the things that really made our salon super successful uh, before we closed it to go on our school venture was it didn't matter what walk of life you came, that you were from. You could be the businessman that was a high that was a high time or big time banker at Quicken Loans, or you could be somebody that's working at the pizza shop down down the street. It didn't matter what your race was. When you came in, you can get a haircut. The vibe of the salon was amazing. Think about it like this. You talk about changing the way you look at things. So the things you look at change our salon where we're breaking barriers my wife who is white her 80 percent of her clientele were black women right i who am african-american highly mel melanated as everybody can see 90 percent of my clients were white guys so then we had a colorist who also did afro textured hair and straight hair so in order for you to fully be effective as a salon pro but also as a salon owner you have to have and make sure that everybody in your salon or your barbershop regardless of what the skin color they may have can cut any and every texture because if you don't you're going to you're going to sell yourself short of making money and who wants to do that you know and, and would you say, Roderick, then if, if that's the case and everybody, let's say the six of us work in a salon and we're all trained in every facet, and uh, but um, I haven't done uh, uh, a different type of hair in how many, uh, how many weeks I should be either assisting somebody or practicing it, what would be the standard? Three weeks, four weeks, what do you think? I mean, should, should businesses be putting that level of standard in there because, um, uh, when we when we had Mickey on when we were talking together, one of the things that she shared was, you know, she wasn't comfortable doing the balayage, but got in trouble when she voiced that. And two Caucasian girls that worked in the salon weren't comfortable doing African American hair texture, even though they were trained on it. But the salon owner um, wasn't upset with them and uh, enforced upon Mickey that she had to do it. So if everybody's trained. Uh, but I haven't done it in how long a period of time? How often should I be practicing? How often should I be assisting? What's the thoughts there? 
you know, I think that's that's a real good question. Um, you know, there's there's been there's been several circumstances that come along in in salon life and in and in running a salon where you know some of the some of the people that you hire may not necessarily be fully trained uh, the way that you want to. Um, I believe in apprentice programs. I believe that you know at some point, regardless if you're the stylist that's been in the industry for two years or 20 years, at some point we all have to be each other's crutches. You know, um, I tell my students this all the time. If I'm looking down at you, is to help you up. So as salon owners and and people that's been in the industry for some time, we got to we got to be each other's crutches, and we have to continue to cultivate those relationships so where people don't feel uncomfortable about asking questions. You know, there's no such thing as a dumb question. But again, it all goes back to that fear. It's the fear of not being accepted. It's the fear of looking stupid or looking dumb or 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 you know the the the, the black girl who runs back in the color room when she has a straight haircut to do. You know what I'm saying? So once we start to get get our students that are coming into the industry well trained and well diverse once we start to get school owners who stop looking at the numbers and start looking at the people jesus we got to stop counting numbers we got to start to look at the people and we got to build relationships yeah. with our students regardless if they're white black spanish puerto rican plaid or argyle it doesn't matter once you build that good working relationship it doesn't matter and here's the thing steve people don't students don't learn from people they don't like Mm. Let's talk about that, right? Sure is that. You know, I've been I've been in school situations before where I've seen just a group of black girls over here, and of course they have the white instructor, and and it's always, oh well, you know, I'm going to give them a lesson, and I'm going to teach them what they what I need to teach them. If they don't get it, then they just don't get it. What what where, where they do that at? That's 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 breaking every code of education and being an educational leader. You never give up on your students because each student needs a champion. And myself, plus these three women and everybody else that is listening that are instructors, all of our students need champions, okay? They need a champion. They need a person that understands is gonna believe in them regardless of what their situation is and what type of social, economic, or ethnic background they come from. I love that, Roderick. And before I kick it over to Carrie, I'm just going to add because it kind of ties into what to what Jalia said um, about creating a portfolio and a lookbook that shows the diversity of your talent and all the different things you can do. So if there's any of you out there that are trained to do different hair types and it's been a hot minute since you've done it, go find a model, go do a shoot, go get your hands and heart in it, update your lookbook, put it out on social demonstrate who you are don't just wait around you know if you're not seeing african-american clients go find them and do some shoots and demonstrate your talent go assist get yourself involved there's so many different things that we can do and that's certainly one of them and i, I think it speaks to what both of you said um so i'm going to kick it over to you carrie keep this conversation going here um thank you roderick thank you J J julia i know we'll come back with uh you know, some final thoughts on our end, uh, but we've got three powerhouses here that uh, need to get that need need to share some powerful things. So, Carrie, over oh, to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. I mean, just the sharing um, between the three of you really is just so humbling. And um, I think, you know, on a personal note that um, when when we hear the term, you know, privilege or white privilege and, and us white people out there and um, don't make me get a Kleenex tonight. Kia, don't don't make me with my eyelashes get yeah, um, that that you know we automatically think that doesn't refer to us or or mean anything to us because we're progressive thinkers and we're open and and wow the stories that that are shared just bring me really to my knees around what that really means and as I continue to lean in and 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 learn as as um, not being a person of color right that I have not as much melanin right roderick that i uh, right so uh, you have you, you, listen listen carrie you just have a slight melanin deficiency we can work on that <laughs> you can work on that you go yeah. listen you're off from south carolina go to folly beach lay out for about two or three hours it does happen quick for me but um so i just want to say that it just is every time i'm engaged in these conversations that i'm really leaning in on and i'm just so passionate about right now it continues to remind me of things i've never had to go through and i've never had to deal with and it just is like 
it, it just is a, all, every time I'm engaged in this, it is an aha moment for me. So thank you guys for your courage to speak up in your strength and in your power, because it's, mm -hmm. this is a really big deal. I read an article um, the other day, and I just want to start our session off. And uh, um, Daryl Scott wrote this article called Black is Beautiful, and he just opened it up by saying, over the past few days, I've been saddled with questions from my non-people of color friends about what they can do to help stem the tide of systemic racism. It's a question that's dogged me over the years, he says, because of a person, because as a person of color, I felt that it shouldn't be my duty to teach grown adults about systems in which they participate in and are advantaged by, but I believe we've reached a point where perhaps it's time to speak up, he says. And I just thought, wow, now the conversations are, we are engaging. And I wanna just thank you guys for speaking up. I wanted to kind of kick this off. Um, I'm gonna start with Kia and our conversation the other day, Kia, when you and I were talking, and you and I, we go back a little ways. Um, we met at Intercoiffure, and um, and it has just been like such a, um, a connection since we met. And when we were talking the other day, you had a really interesting um, <clears throat> metaphor um, about if if I was if I went to an optometrist, right? We were talking about how you view things and how our vision is and how we see things. <laughs> and um, and I want to just jog your memory a minute, a minute about this because we talked about a million things over the course of the hour. Um, but you had said to me first, somebody would have to acknowledge that their vision is blurred, mm -hmm. that they don't, that their vision is not clear. First, like it's acknowledging, and, and you said the second thing was to accept what's broken. And, and that acceptance piece is really the piece where, where the openness comes in. And, um, and then we talked about how everybody has their own individual path. And can you just elaborate and, and talk a little bit more about that? Because you're such a great storyteller. Oh, Carrie, thank you so much. Um, you know, when we spoke the other day, I, I believe that analogy is the best way to kind of get people to see things in more in, in a space where they can understand it better. And we were talking about the 2020 vision and how, and I don't, I don't know how we led into that. And I was just pointing out that, you know, first of all, you have to identify that there's a problem because I know for me, it took me a long time to even make uh, an appointment to go get glasses. I had to acknowledge that something was indeed wrong because I wanted to feel like I was whole and I wanted to feel like everything was okay with my vision. But in this step, in this moment, just realizing and recognizing that yes, something is wrong. Maybe my vision isn't as perfect. Maybe I'm not seeing things exactly the way they are. And then you dive into and make a commitment to say, okay, my first step is let me make an appointment. Let me be uh, let me be examined. Let me search my heart. That's biblical. Search my own heart. Let me see, you know, be open for someone to, to check things off the list. And I remember, I remember saying to you, when we're looking, when we're being tested, they give us line for line. And yeah. they're like, every time you could read something, okay, we went to the next line. Okay, maybe that's not the issue. That's not your point of pain. And then we got all the way down to the area that needed work. And wherever you met your level of uncomfort or difficulty understanding something is where we needed to press in, which is where your eye doctor would press in for you. And I, and I, oddly, that analogy came up because I was like, you know what? Sometimes it isn't that you're actually racist. We're not saying you're racist. We're not, you know, maybe you do have black friends. Okay, great. Maybe you do work with black people. Maybe you do have, you know, clients that have texture here. Maybe you are familiar, but maybe you don't understand your privilege. Maybe you don't understand how to be an ally. Maybe that's the part we need to mm -hmm. lean into. And once you get the prescription, once we identify the problem and identify the broken space or a space that needs improvement, then you have to subscribe to whatever the, the prescription is. And you have mm -hmm. to be committed to say, I'm going to wear these glasses every day so that I can see better, be better, do better. I'm going to wear these contacts. I'm gonna have surgery if I have to, to clear my vision so that I can posture myself and be the best I can be and see things the way they're supposed to be. And just in that analogy, it's about a heart work. It is about a heart work. This, this, what we're talking about in this rousing, when people say to me, what can I do? My first answer is always lean into your personal work and understand where it is that you, you draw the line. Where is your pain? Where is your pressure point? 
where did you stop understanding where we are? Mm -hmm. and, that, and in that space, then you can commit, like I said, to picking up your mantle to be anti-racist every day. That mm -hmm. is a mantle that you pick up like a cross every day. You have a choice, just like I forget my glasses and I know I'm gonna have a hard time that day. Every day I have to choose to see clearer and, and operate in my full self every single day. I just, I love that analogy. It really, really spoke to me. Um, and I also want to highlight your movement, Texture Versus Race. And this is something that over the years, I have been so drawn to the name, which I just was saying to you the other day, that it's like, this is like a God name. You know, this was like, I don't know where that came from, but this, in this name, it speaks volumes to the lack of education in our industry based on skin color as opposed to hair texture and just with that name and and it has been that way for me with you for years that so talk a little bit about that because i just think that is just so fascinating so texture versus race i can tell you where it came from because it absolutely didn't come from me i did not intend to, I didn't in my own self say, yes, I'm just going to be strategic. And I strategically brought that name. I believe that God dropped that name on me in the middle of my frustration with having to now take my all-inclusive color culture curriculum and now cherry pick that to be mm -hmm. texture education. I was not okay with that because I didn't want that perpetual pigeonhole in that box that we live in as Black colorist or as a black stylist that does black hair and black color. And, and I was frustrated because I said, God, I said, what, what is it that I'm supposed to do here? And all of a sudden it just dropped out of nowhere. And I wrote it down and I was like, whoa, even I was taken aback. I was like, oh, so I'm supposed to talk about this. Like, okay, what about that? The pivot. I mean, I thought we were doing yellow and blue mace green, like fabric. I mean, that's, that, where did it come from? So <laughs> when that happened, I put it on my wall and I left it there for about three and a half months and not even touching it because I didn't exactly know what I was supposed to do with it. And through much prayer, and you know, I believe that God just said this because I was frustrated and I said, well, how do I teach people? I mean, why, why do they think it's so hard to learn texture? What is so difficult about learning a skill or just obtaining more information? And I said, what they really need to learn is how to do each other. It's really not here. And God said, and that's what you're going to talk about. And that's how it took off. It was, it was you're going to teach people how to do people and then teach them how to do a skill. And to lean on what Roger said, it's about having culture competence. It's about learning how the culture of a people to learn their hair, not just learn how to do them, but learn how to develop a culture that embodies everybody. The skill will come. It's really about, it's about us individually with our social preferences. It's about our unconscious biasness. It's about the stereotypes that guide yes. us into the places that we are. It's about like what Robin said, it's about the school seeding fear when growing out of mm -hmm. that separation and division in the beauty industry. The mm -hmm. church and the salons are the only two institutions left to be overtly segregated as is. We have not addressed it. We have overlooked it. We have silently and complicitly allowed it. And this is the only place that has no government. And so now we have to be the government. So Texture versus Race stands in the gap with that, along with several other voices and people who have come before us and people who are banding with and doing their thing. We are all now saying enough is enough. Now is the time to actually do something and govern ourselves accordingly. Oh, that was so beautifully spoken. And it reminds me, I'm going to pivot over to Marquetta because Marquetta, when we were talking the other day, you said that you specifically went to a white beauty school mm -hmm. so that you didn't get pigeonholed into yes. doing one type of hair. Can you just talk to, to us a little bit about that? Because I thought like, wow, because you and I were talking, I was saying that even when I was in beauty school, I don't even remember ever seeing an African-American doll head. I didn't even, I, I, I don't, now that I'm seeing them, I'm like, oh, I don't even know that I've seen one before. And wow. so I want to, I want to just talk a little bit about kind of those two things and, and your thoughts on that. So I knew that in order for me to truly, and like everybody has said already, in order for me to 
um, approach this industry, the beauty industry, and be well diverse, that required me to have to go to a school where I was going to learn predominantly white hair because I was very familiar with my own hair texture, but that was one of the things that, that I did to more qualify myself so that I could be more appealing. Mm. If I were going to go and work in a salon for somebody else, now I would be more appealing because I can do everything, even though I believe that I would have still been the black girl that does all of the black clients and a little bit of the white clients, but at least I would have that in my repertoire. And even in cosmetology school, we still had to deal with the same thing. If, if black clients came into the school, they went to the black students. So mm -hmm. even though I went to a, a predominantly white school for cosmetology, I still had to, to mostly do black hair. I learned about doing other textures and other ethnicities, but that was only learning. It was very few hands-on moments that I had. And that's so unfortunate. And I agree with everybody who said this already. And I've been saying this for the past month. Every time I get on a panel, sit on a panel, it starts in cosmetology school. It starts mm -hmm. in the books, to be honest with you. There's not enough information. Yesterday um, with, with Sam Via, there was um, uh, a 30-minute segment that Yanae Damtu taught about culture and our hair. Those are the things that need to be put in the cosmetology books. We need to learn about the culture. Why do we do the things we do? Why do we wear our hair this way? Why does it need to be taken care of this way? None of that stuff is addressed, so yeah. there's no confidence there. So in order for us to be able to stand behind the chair, uh, whether you're black, white, brown, green, it doesn't matter, you have confidence. So the reason why a white stylist only deals with white clients is because that's the area that they're confident in, because we know about the heritage. We know about the big perm machines and we know about how all of that stuff happened in the for, for white people. But we don't know. We know. But it's not taught on the black side yeah. on the african-american side of things so that's why it's so scary i don't know why i need to use this chemical or i don't know uh I, there's just not enough information out there culturally it needs to be the same thing across the board i believe that the curriculums need to be rewritten in these books there's a lot of information that's left out that it, that needs to be put in there so that there can be confidence across the board so that we don't have to just put ourselves in this little box and then dip over here to learn this technique and then i'm going to go learn this technique and then i can add that to my it shouldn't be that way it should be that when we come out of cosmetology school we're not a number and we're not taught to a test we actually learn all textures of hair, how to do hair as a whole, and not just one thing or not just the subset of things. So I, I that's that's just so powerful. And when when you talk about that and you talk about really um changing the curriculum in schools, mm -hmm. which would then change what students get tested out in. And the test out then, right? The test outs and when people mm -hmm. graduate is on the gamut of hair textures. And then talk to us a little bit about then how that translates into salons that have education programs in their salon, because I think it's it, it translates into the same thing. What are the salons educating their their teams on and why and i ask myself the same question too and this is an area i'm leaning into i want you to speak to it um around um the what what the education should look like inside hair salons so that it's, there is a sense of inclusion with not only clients but also with staff with hiring staff i think it starts from a place of comfortability if you're in a white salon, you're comfortable just doing those clients. You don't really want to deal with anybody else because then you got to spark up this whole new thing and you got to do all this new training. And, and at the end of the day, in my mind, the thought process is, well, I'm already successful doing this. Is it really worth it? So I think it starts there with the mm. comfortability aspect of things. But, but on the flip side, ask yourself, if you're one of those people, ask yourself the opposite question. 
what service am I doing by being comfortable in this situation when I could be servicing a whole nother sector of people that it could bring unity into the industry instead of being comfortable doing only what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I think in the for training wise, I absolutely think that there should be training across the board. I the the worst thing for me is to have to if I would have when I was uh, when I owned my salon having to I never I, I never had to turn anybody away. It didn't matter what color you were. I don't care uh, what texture of hair you had. If you sat in my chair, I could service you. And that's not the same for other other salons. And I think it starts with taking a stand and saying, look, as the owner, we are going to have education. We are going to bring black educators in. We are going to learn about text, different textures of hair, and we will start taking those clients and actually doing it. But it's more than just saying it and bringing them in, but it's also the action behind it that's really, really, really important because a lot of people can talk a good game, but are you really going to do this and take the necessary steps? Because there are some incredibly talented African-American hairstylists in this industry. And a lot of us who are talented, the other piece to that too is on these platforms and doing these different education um, things for these different companies, we don't want to just deal with textured hair. We don't right. just do textured hair. I know an amazing hairstylist. I, well, I know tons of amazing hairstylists who can slay a bob on a white lady the same way they can on a black lady. And you and when they walk out of that salon, you can't tell who did the hair. That's what it's all about. Yes. It really was. So we don't always want to be the one that has to deal with the textured hair. We don't want to do that. We want to be included as a whole to do hair, period. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important, especially on the education side, bringing in those educators that can teach if, if that is what you need in, in your salon, if you're a salon owner that can teach the textured hair and doing those practices and then opening up and saying, you know what, we're going to do this and taking those actionable steps. I think that's very, very, very important. I think uh, I love that. And I think one thing, too, to even just add tap onto that is, you know, you said that it's one thing to educate and one thing to show how to do it. But are you actually going to do it? And I think when we think of a marketing perspective, the next step would then be to start integrating people of color on the grid, right, on the gram grid and start really um, if you say you're going to be inclusive, what is what are your actions? And you mm -hmm. have to show that so that all different um, people of color and hair textures, no matter what it is, are comfortable coming into your salon, which also speaks to um, stylists that are going to want to work there that feel that sense of inclusion as well. And mm -hmm. so, gosh, I've learned I've learned so much already. I, I'm not sure where we are on a time perspective, Leslie, but I could if you want me to keep going, I have like a I have a I have a lot of things to talk about today. So, so I think we? We, can, we can go a little longer. And I actually there's a question that relates to this that's come up and I want to I would like to ask it and then kind of have this open to all of the panelists. Um, it's so the question came in from one of our viewers. Why should I, as a white woman who can never understand the complexities of life as a black person, try to get black clients? Shouldn't we find other ways to support black salons and black cosmetologists? There's a study out showing that black patients have better health outcomes when paired with a black doctor um, because there's a shared experience, et cetera, et cetera. So can you speak to that question? Anyone to go first? Any of you, all I'm of like, you, any of you. <laughs> um, okay, so I would say, um, how about if, um, uh, Roderick, do you want to, I saw you kind of leading into that a little bit. Do you want to go ahead and take the, are you muted? I think you're muted. Yeah. Unmuted, he's unmuted. He, he's, okay. he muted himself. <laughs> okay. I can't okay, am I good no. now? Am I good yeah. now? All right, can you hear me yes. now? Yes. All right. Um, could you rephrase that question for me? With kind of going in and out. Oh yeah, sure. So the question was, um, I've got to pull it back up. Just one quick second. 
I closed it out and should not. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, why should I, as a white woman who can never understand the complexities of life as a black person, try to get black clients? Shouldn't we find other ways to support black salons and black cosmetologists? And then she mentions there was a study showing that black patients have better health outcomes when paired with a black physician because of a shared experience. Um, let's see. I wish there, I was better at textured hair. Um, but in order to be better, I would need to be doing it regularly. And I feel like, why would a black person want to come to me when there are amazing black salons in my area? You know what? I think that's that's a really good question. And one thing that, that a lot of white people, I don't think that they really know about black people is, is that we're very comforting. We, we're, we're very loyal. You can come in, you can walk into a black salon as a white person and, and you're gonna get that acceptance. It is not because of anything, but just, just who we are as a people. Um, I think that um, there's a lot of companies out there that, that, that actually do really do a good job of showing African-American faces. Um, um, pivot point, number one, their, their aesthetic for education and how they break it down, whether it be through texture or straight or barbering or cosmetology. And, and for those of us who have, that have seen it, their new aesthetics book is amazing. Like they got some melanated um, uh, models in there and it looks really, really great. Um, what I would suggest is something that my wife did a, a, about probably about 10 years ago. Um, she actually went into a black salon and volunteered her time. She wanted to learn a little bit more about Afro textured hair. So she went in and she just volunteered. She didn't get paid. She did cuts, but she did whatever she needed to do to, to assist. She was an assistant, my, my Naha winner, finalist, assisting. You know what I mean? And I think there's a certain level of, of humility that goes into the educational process too. You have to be a sponge. You have to be, you have to be open to learning and absorbing. Number one, it's gonna be a completely different experience than, than you've ever had walking into any other salon, especially if you're going into the hood. You're gonna make sure, you, you're, you're gonna have a completely different emotional experience because now you're gonna really get, get to understand the culture, not necessarily the hair, but the culture of the African-American community or, or the African-American barbershop or salon. So I think that all of those things, and I think that all of those things are super, super important um, for her. And just just ask, um, you know, sometimes you can put something out on Facebook or Instagram, just saying, hey, you know what? I'm looking for somebody with Afro textured hair. Um, would you be open for a complimentary service? Closed mouths don't get fed. So I just think it's important to ask. You know, I think that's great, uh, great feedback, um, Roderick. And I, I, one thing that that really uh, is ringing to me right now, Leslie, with that question, and it, it, to me, it goes right back to texture versus race, right? It's like, it, it, isn't this about the hair? We're hairdressers, and so when I when I'm hearing that question. To me, it goes back to everything we've talked about, that it is not about the color of the skin. It is about educating yourself on doing a specific texture in hair or doing skin, no matter what the color of the skin is. It's about doing the makeup and skincare based on your artistic and technical ability. Uh, mm -hmm. Kia, could you just jump in on that? Because I also, I know that like, I'm here with texture versus race over here. I'm like, I'm, I'm now like in the movement. So, you know, the first thing I thought in that was, you know, when you're starting a movement and you are, are behind a movement like, like this, one of the things you have to be okay with is not everyone is going to move. And you have to be okay with that. Okay, so let me just start right here. So I'm not here to change a made up mind. But what I will say is in her asking the question, I do feel like there's a there's a space for us to get in and help understand what's at stake here. So I'll say a couple things. One, if you are not turning away any clients of any texture, if you're not losing any money and your clients are stacked and you're good and you can ride out the rest of your career and wherever you live, like I've had people say, I'm in Utah. I don't even see black people on a regular basis. So, okay. Okay, great. If that's not your thing, don't. I get it. That's fine. Maybe you should use your resources differently. Maybe this isn't the space that you want to get in. Do I agree that we should continue this way? But if this is the way where she is, I'm okay with that. But like she said, maybe it would be best if they found someone who may have a shared experience. If that's your understanding of it, 
fine. But, but here's what I'll say. Well, why don't you educate someone black so they can learn how to do straighter hair texture? Maybe donate your resources and time there. You become an advocate and an ally and level the playing field. So if you feel that all the black people should say, maybe another client, another stylist doesn't feel that way. Maybe she wants to learn some textured hair. And to Roderick's point, his, his wife went to a salon that had mostly black people. Well, you go and let someone come to your salon and maybe learn to finish with you and share some information there. So I'm not saying that she must learn how to do textured right. hair. But what I'm saying is if you are turning people away and you are not leaning into the inclusivity of the industry as a whole, and maybe you're, you are turning people away and you have an innate fear, then yes, you should learn. Because one thing I will say at the end of the day, what texture versus race really does kind of put light on is that you're not necessarily afraid of the texture because you see that texture every day in your chair. It just shows up in a package that you're way more comfortable with. That's the issue. You see these same curly, coily, kinky. You see the same fine, medium, coarse. You see porosity, low porosity. You see all of these different characteristics in your chair anyway. So it's, you have to ask your question, is it the hair that I'm afraid of or is it the person that I'm afraid of? And that, again, is an individualistic work. And if you don't want to be on that journey, I am absolutely fine with that. Those that do, those are, those are the ones that I lean into. And, and give time to. You know what, Key, I'm glad you said that because sometimes it's both. It's both the fear of the hair and the fear of the people. Yeah. But that's an individual journey. That's a humanist, that's a humanity issue. That's, that's inside. A humanity issue. Yeah. It has, and it, that supersedes the industry. You know, that that far, that goes on behind beyond behind the chair as well. So. And Kia, that's a lot of what we talked about too the other day. That it is a this is a, a a human journey. This is an individual journey of looking inside and saying, where does my heart take me, and where do I need to go in order to be an ally, in order to be anti-racist, in order to support this 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 journey of inclusivity and justice and equality. And so every this is an individual journey uh, that people are gonna need to go on. And it starts, it starts with looking in the mirror. Just like when people say, how do I become a better leader? Well, it's, it's a personal journey. What are you willing to do to look at what our character flaws are, to look at where we need to do better? Um, and, and only until, we can only give what we have. Right. And so the better we get, the better we're able to give. So. And just one more thing. Sometimes we're just afraid to be uncomfortable in our space. Sometimes we're just and I don't want to use the word lazy, but I do think that sometimes we don't want to give up any part of our comfort. To yeah. have to learn, to have to change, to have to shift. That's a personal thing. And I will I will say this, that that supersedes behind the chair like that extends in other spaces in your life because when when this time is upon us we are in a pivotal shift in our career yes and by sort of saying well maybe you would be better off going to black people i mean if we if we apply that same principle to every single part of our life let's just take a look at how that would look on a global perspective Thank wow. you. If you all have, don't mind, I have, there's a couple other questions I'd love to be able to address and then we can wrap up if you all have the time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So here's, here's another one. Um, what ideas do the panelists have specifically in helping PBA um, to use the, and, and I didn't plant this question, by the way, um, to help <laughs> use their industry presence, but I appreciate it, Kimberly, for, for sending that in. Um, what ideas do you have for helping PBA to use our industry presence and our broad reach to break the systemic challenges and to help create systems and processes to show that there is equitable education, educators, what could we, should we be doing? And, you know, we are committed to making these changes. Well, I think, um, I think you guys are already doing it. Um, what you're doing here is, is amazing. And, Leslie, you and I have had conversations outside of this, and I personally know how active you are and um, in, in wanting to bring change and wanting to 
um, broaden the horizons for uh, the Professional Beauty Association. So I think that what is already happening behind the scenes is bringing change. And I see the action behind that. So starting doing panels like this and um, bringing in more black educators into some of the shows or all of the, not some of the shows, all of the shows and um, allowing us to come in and not even create brand new things so that we can have a corner over here or a corner over there, but allowing us to share the stage, if you will, with other educators that are white. Um, I think that's important, but I, I believe that you guys are already doing, doing that proactively. So that's just my take. I think there's a little bit more work that needs to be done. Um, and I'm gonna be very specific as to why I say that. Um, I recall making suggestions last year um, to a few different individuals regarding putting a panel together um, for people of color. And I say people of color because I wasn't trying to just um, focus it on black people. I wanted it to include a lot of different individuals of different races because we all as minorities have different experiences than individuals that are Caucasian. And I remember um, depending on the person that I spoke to, it was, no, we don't have time for that right now. We'll get to it at a later date. You know, some it was, yes, it was a good idea. Um, so we shouldn't have to have the conversation now because it's top of mind because Black Lives Matter, a uh, Black person being killed, this is not new. This has been happening forever, for years. However, now it's at a boiling point because everybody is tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. So it's, in, it's always in, interesting to me to see how things kind of unfold because we could have been on top of this a long time ago. I'm sure that I was not the only one. Again, I'm the rookie of everybody here as far as beauty industry experience. But I, I like I said, I have just as much experience on the business side. So I understand being the only black person in an executive or a leadership seat. I know what that feels like. And we could have gotten ahead of this a long time time ago so you have to take a little bit of ownership in okay we dropped the ball here what can we do as far as actionable steps to move forward and make sure that we're moving forward and we're hearing from diverse groups of individuals like i said when i first started speaking we are talking so much about hair but we have to include all facets of the beauty industry every single part of it, whether it's barbering, nails, makeup and skin. I, I can I have stories for days on situations and instances that I've been in as it relates to skin and skin texture and pigment and melanin. I, I can go on and on and on about it. So I think that this is a good starting point, but be open when someone brings you an idea about something, don't just brush it under the rug because you don't feel like you have time for it or you don't think you're gonna get the buy-in for it, especially when individuals are really pushing hard for it and you know that they're working, you know that they're out there making strides in everything that they do. Sometimes we just push people to the side, oh, I don't have time for that, make time. Um, I, I, I'm going to say that uh, uh, a big shout out to to Julia. Um, I wanted to say that I, I do think that there's still a little bit of work to be done as well. Um, up until curly hair and texture became a thing, um, a lot of African American models were 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 entered into the North American Hairstyling Awards. And for for a long time, and even myself, I've been told to never enter a black model in Naha because it'll never get it'll never get chosen. My wife has entered endless collections of black models into Naha, never got chosen. But until the manufacturers started to realize, hey, wait a minute, we can make money off curly. Let's rebrand, let's relabel, let's make this look good. That's when you start to see a lot more people um, entering into the texture competition, but also you saw, and, and not a lot, but a couple sprinkles of black models in the in the competitions. I would say that the judges really need to have a, a keen eye for what the world views as beautiful versus what they feel as beautiful. 
and you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and, and when I think about textured hair, I think about African-American women. I think about people who have that natural texture. It has always had that natural texture, but for some reason that proverbial rose colored glasses are still on and they don't view black people and black faces as being beautiful in the competitions. Um, I would like to see some different judges. I would like to see, you know, uh, some of the categories actually feature um, black people. Um, you know, it's 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 a little it's a little deterring for a lot of African American artists that do enter Naha year after year after year. We enter one shot year after year after year. We enter all of these competitions. We spend thousands and thousands of dollars on photography and editing, and to to, to it's, it's almost like playing Tiger Woods. You know you're going to lose. You know yeah. you're going to lose. So you don't have a lot of African Americans that even want to enter Naha because the bet is that, well, you know what, I'm just going to spend my money because if I choose a black model or if I choose to use someone of color in the competitions, I'm not going to get I'm not going to get chosen. So um, I would like to to keep a, a, a finger on that pulse and 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 let's get some more black people on the on the uh, professional beauty association committee. Um, right now, um, my wife and I are both state captains for the state of Michigan. We advocate for life and anything that's going on with uh, with legislature as pertaining to rules and regulations. But I also think that um, having some people that actually have a finger on the pulse and are still working behind the chair every day teaching students, those are the people that I think the PBA should probably seek out so that you can get a, a, a I'm going to use what, what Key is saying, um, a, a brighter vision and a, and a bigger scope of services that can be afforded to, to people of color to, to con con continue to show those actionable results. Um, I just want to say in closing, KTSE, keep the same energy. The same times that we have in these panels right now and the number of, I, listen, I have never done so much work in my life. I've never been featured and showcased so much. You know what I'm saying? I was talking to one of my friends. He's like, Roderick, you're a unicorn. You're your magic, my friend. You you got it right now. And here's the thing, you know, uh, it's been told to me that people get bored very fast. People get bored very fast. So for those of us that are of color, the African-American people, while we have the opportunity to continue to push the envelope, we better do it and we need to do it now. Because much like a lot of other uh, initiatives and, and things like that, we too could be gone very quickly. Yeah. So we got we to gotta take the opportunity of the lifetime in the lifetime of this opportunity. So I just wanted to add in just a, a little with what everybody said, not taking up too much time, but I will lead back to the conversation when I met Leslie and some of the people here at PBA. And I really dug in and told them, just how white that this organization has been operating and from that perspective and how they had a lot of blind spots and how you are, you know, there's been some tone deafness going on around mm -hmm. how you operate between Naha, the education, the show, the floor, you know, your the judges, you know, all of that, just the whole perception of whether or not people even know that you exist. And that's kind of been my mantra for every organization that I penetrate, especially the ABCHs, the Intercoiffeurs, and, and PBA, Premier, IBS. I've had this conversation. But what I did like about PBA and Leslie is, in particular is that she actually heard me and she made room for Texas versus race at the last minute in every space that she could at that yep. time. This was just uh, this coming January. So, I, and I believe that you know, you were making some moves then, and I just believe there are more moves to be made, mm -hmm. um, but I do appreciate your ears being open. Even if, like Jalea said, even if you heard it, even if you heard it, you weren't listening. Now you're listening. Now we have your attention, lean into that. When, yes. when the Jaleas and the Marquettas and Roderick and I come to you or whoever comes to you, take it. Like, know that this is solid gold. Nobody has the perspective like us to show you how you treat us. So when we tell you things like not how way too biased because you're, the judges that sit don't have their fingers on the pulse. They have no idea how to critique the skill that's necessary to create those those art, those artists and those artistic uh, uh, projects that we actually do, that those people submit. I think you need to have fresh eyeballs. I think you need to develop, you know, boards of people that you can lean into and say, hey, what do you think about this? How does, how does this look? 
is this is this good and let someone else lean in you may have you're gonna have to hire some folks to do it you know you may you may have to there are people that might do it because they want to see it better education stop leaning into just the people that the manufacturers prop up like i realize they're your resources and they are your sponsors yes. but at the same token there's so much talent that lives beyond the spotlight that you're missing period I probably have the least amount of followers on this platform, but my depth may not be wide, but it, my influence is deep. So therefore, Absolutely. you have to look into the fact that there are people who are doing magnificent work that never see the light of day, that mm -hmm. need a platform. This is it. Use that. If you don't know who they are, ask us. We'll direct you. We'll start mm -hmm. sending you into those places. Your floors. When you see Black people, don't put them in the flea market in the back. People and the newcomers are all in one we don't want to be in one particular corner for classes, like Marquetta said. We don't want our own little individual subsection in your books. We want to be a color. I want color culture to be a color class, whether it's whether it's on blonding, whether it's on foils, whether it's on correction, no matter what it is. I think hair replacement and, and wig making is is global. That has nothing to do with the fact that she's black. Her technique will serve everyone. Okay. Makeup should not be qualified as African American or tone or global makeup. Who does global makeup? You know what I'm saying? Like global touch and hair. Like who does African American or melanated makeup? She does everyone. And I think when we when we start to compartmentalize us in segment as we're furthering the segregation that we have versus when we just throw everybody into and shake the bag up and let it fall where it may. All color is here, all cut is here, all makeup you know, hair extensions, however, barbers, however it is, you have to let us live and let us play where we live. Just stop trying to find a way to segment us. We don't, we don't want you to give us anything. We just want to be on our own merit. We want to qualify on our own merit. And that's where you got to start leaning in. So that's, that's my two cents on that. But thank you so much for having this platform because this has been amazing. I appreciate you letting us tell the truth. Because none of us came here with the intentions of sugarcoating, and I don't think we did that. So nope. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm definitely a barber. I'm not a baker. <laughs> yeah, you won't get you that. won't get no sugar coating up in here. Trust me. <laughs> um, but you know what? And 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 I just wanted to put this little this little bit uh, in as well. Um, you know, we all talked about education for students. I I really would like to see a lot more black educators in Beacon. I want to see more black students in Beacon. Um, sometimes you know, some some sometimes people aren't uh, aren't or can't afford to go to the Avedas and the Paul Mitchells and and those types of schools where they 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 they, they you know they fund their student trips. Um, let's look at some of the mom and pop schools and let's give some of those kids some opportunity. And and get out there and tell them what Beacon is and why Beacon is so important. Um, I know that I've taught at Beacon. Steve G, you've been at Beacon. Jalea taught at Beacon before, and it's a little discouraging when you see 300 kids that are supposed to be the top 300 kids in the nation, and you see two people that look like you. What happened? You know, I think I think that when and fundraising efforts, there should probably be some scholarships for those kids. They can't afford to to you know getting in Beacon is one thing, but being able to fly out to to, to Long Beach and to get a hotel room for three days and feed yourself and 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 look presentable and all those things that's that could be that could weigh very very heavy on someone who may be from you know an area or a demographic where they don't have the funds to do that. So um, I think that, okay. that that outreach programs from a grassroots perspective is is key. But again. It all starts with students. Everything right now, it starts with students. It starts with color, color education. It starts with makeup education. It starts with cranial prosthesis. Come on with it, Marquetta. You oh, know, wait. You know, yeah, we're not, we're not, you, and, and and that's the thing. We're talking, we're not just talking about wig making. We're talking about a prosthetic for the yes. hair. I stopped calling yes. myself a barber. I'm now a cranial architect and a subject matter expert in barber education. You've got people out there that write. Everybody on here has written their own curriculum. Why yeah. can't we get jobs? I think the biggest thing that, that that needs to happen is we just need to be hired. There's a lot of value that and, and experience that we can share with people. And you know, knowing our stories, you never know what somebody may be going through. And we can we can share those stories. You know, I think that everybody on this panel, we don't just share our successes. We we it's, it's important for us to share our failures because you never know what somebody else may be going through and you can help to lift them up and get them to the next level. Amazing. 
just thank you all. Thing. I see the clapping. Yeah. I'm, I know you can't yeah. see me, but yeah. clapping. Um, but I just thank you all for that information. And I want you to know that um, some of my colleagues and I behind the scenes here have been messaging back and forth about things that you're saying and yes and that and we're changing that and before the Naha discussion even started we're like we are start you know we need different blood and new blood and so we just all again at PBA want you to know how committed we all are to making the changes and continuing to lean into the conversation and hearing and having the difficult conversations and working together to unite so with that um, just thank you to Carrie and Stephen for your time for uh, doing the interviews can I ask, and can I ask one thing before we, yes. before we wrap up yes. Um, uh, Marquetta wants to give oh. the benediction. So, okay. all right, good, because I'm not good at that. So, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Have a fabulous evening. Thank you, everyone. And for those of you who could, um, if you, if people want to see this, you'll be able to share it. It's been recorded, so we will be sharing the recording tomorrow as well. So, Marquetta, I leave it to you, and then good Hello. night. <laughs> Thank you. So, I, I just want to leave, um, I just want to leave everybody with this. Um, I, I served my country for nine and a half years. I was in the Air Force for um, a very long time. And one of the most disheartening things, and it's actually, I have tears welling up, um, because one of the most disheartening things being in the Air Force was um, there was always an issue with hair. And if we wanted to wear our natural hair, it was considered faddish. It wasn't considered natural. We were almost forced to either wear braids, wigs, weaves, or a relaxer. And the narrative should have been that, no, this is natural. This is our hair. But we have the power in the beauty industry to unite and change that narrative. And I think for so many years with us, um, with everything that we have been through as black people, um, there's been such a negative connotation on our hair and um, the Afro doesn't look good. That texture of hair is, is not nice. Uh, who wants to wear that texture of hair? And that has translated over into the beauty industry, is translated over into the schools and is translated over into the salons and that narrative needs to change. But I'm, I'm saying that to say this, once we come together and unite on one front and educate ourselves on all the aspects of hair all together, texture, straight, whatever it is, then there can be true change in the way other people outside of the beauty industry look at our hair, look at hair as a whole, because we have the ability to do something that I don't think any other profession can do, and that's change people's perception about how they feel about themselves. So when they sit in our chairs, if they have textured hair, it should not be looked upon negatively. We should have enough knowledge to be able to say, you know what, your hair is beautiful, but this is what we're gonna do to make it, to enhance its beauty. And I just wanna leave the viewers with that, that we have to come together on a united front and educate ourselves on textured hair and educate ourselves on the culture behind our hair and then start to move together on one front. Awesome. All right, Steve, grab the collection plate. Come on, let's go. Grab the <laughs> collection right. plate, Steve. <laughs> Carrie, I'm make sure to it, check man. the door. We done preached. <laughs> Everything is together now. Oh, so okay. You I love got it. it. Thank Roderick, you, everybody. Roderick, Thank you know what you're sending in the mail. My card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, for being a part of this. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, um, thank you to all of our amazing panelists. Uh, you all shared uh, so much important context. And you know, um, I'll just leave it with this. These conversations don't have to be hard. They're as hard as we make them. Um, if you feel that these are challenging conversations, ask yourself why you're challenged by it. And look if you can shift that perception. Uh, be curious to learn a whole nother culture that there's so much magic and pride and there's so much heritage and history that we all can benefit from. So we just invite you as a panel to be curious and uh, to understand and to seek to understand. Uh, the more that we can understand, the more our context of life itself and how we operate in this industry and how we serve our communities uh, can only be enlivened by. Thank you so much to the PBA and to everybody for joining and listening. Uh, and again, to this amazing panel, Roderick, Marquetta, 
Leah and Kia, you are all just amazing people. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.